been in America now for 10 years and many things brought me here but I would say what made me stay the reason why I'm still here is because I found a sense of space a sense of belonging and um, and therefore I found I was gonna say I found my own freedom but in a way I guess I gave myself the chance of finding my own freedom and, um, you know, it probably has to do with the fact that when I was in France, I never really felt that I belonged there. And it has nothing to do with France and its intrinsic qualities and what it has to offer. Really, it was a very, very personal thing, something that really was in a way irrational. And uh, um, 
And when I arrived here, actually what first brought me here was a concert, it was very simple. And, uh, but somehow here this, this lack of sense of membership um, ceased to be important, ceased to be an obsession as it had been before. Um, and so from that point, obviously, the whole, you know, the idea of living here, the place became um, really propitious to my own, to my own development. And of course, now that I've created an environment that's, you know, that's mine, um, I doubt I could, at least at this point, I can't really picture myself elsewhere. I was a fairly agitated child. Um, I was always finished in school before the others, always ahead, always wanted to know more, to know um, things that were out of place, that were ahead of the program. It was just a disturbance, really, um, and um, asking all sorts of inappropriate questions. So my parents got enough complaints and um, decided that perhaps channeling my surplus of energy might be a good thing. Um, and they introduced me to a number of different activities, um, sports, tennis, martial arts, dance. Um, and curious as I was, nothing really clicked. I mean, it was interesting for a couple of lessons, um, but really it wasn't, that wasn't it. And then music came along, um, and that was immediate. It's, it's really funny because really what it did was, was um, capture my imagination. And um, so probably my surplus of energy wasn't so much physical as it was a mental one. This teacher of mine at the ex-conservatory said, you know, I'm going to make an appointment with Pierre Barbizet. Um, He's a wonderful French pianist, um, particularly in Beethoven and actually many other areas of the repertoire. Played often with Christian Ferras as well, the violinist, and was the director of the Marseille Conservatory. Um, and she felt that in a way by, you know, by meeting him and hopefully getting his, his approval and guidance, my parents might be reassured about letting me continue um, in music. So that's what happened. She took me there and I was, I guess, almost 11 years old and I played for him the uh, very beginning of the Schumann Papillon and the first movement of Beethoven Sonata. And I was just, you know, elated. Um, and I told him at the end, I said, well, this is the most beautiful day of my life. And he said, well, if you continue this way, I gather you'll have many others. Pierre Babizé said she must, she must go to the Paris Conservatory and, um, and I will help prepare her. And, um, and so that's what happened. And a year and a half later, um, as soon as was possible to do, um, I um, went and took the competition and was, uh, I guess, entered, you know, with a, a unanimous vote. Um, and it was the beginning of a great adventure. The second year started a, um, I don't know, 
rebellious phase where I didn't want to be working on the repertoire that was imposed. I was um, hungry for large format pieces. You know, I wanted to work on big sonatas and concertos. And so eventually Jacques Rouvier, who was my teacher there, said, um, you know, if I can't instill any, you know, discipline in you, um, then I, would, I don't want to see you here until you're capable of playing the things that you're required to play. It's as simple as that. So, um, so for a couple of weeks, I actually did not reappear and worked on the Chopin Concerto on my own. Um, and managed to um, convince uh, a uh, chamber orchestra locally in X to actually perform it, to include the piece in their program, sort of, you know, last minute. Um, and so I was able to get it out of my system. I did go back to Paris, played it once for my very magnanimous teacher who actually agreed to listen to it. And, um, and of course it's very funny because in that last week, just before the performance, all of a sudden because it was out of my system, or soon to be, um, I was able to actually start concentrating on those various etudes that were required. And I ended up playing the concerto uh, in F, Chopin, number two, and then uh, followed by, as encores, all those required um, pieces of the puzzle for the exam, um, and brought the tape back to my teacher to prove that I had not wasted my time entirely while I was mostly on my own. And, um, and he liked the tape and played it for Yoshi Kawaguchi, who was a producer for Denon, Nippon Columbia at the time. Mr. Kawaguchi think, came to the class a couple of weeks later, and, um, um, and then in the summer of 85, after my graduation, my first prize, um, we went ahead and recorded this very first CD with uh, Rachmaninoff's second sonata and some into tableau from the Opus 33. When I um, graduated with my first prize, um, one person did not vote for me in the jury. And, uh, and of course I was terribly offended, but you know, I had to learn to live with it. It was a good first lesson. And then when the um, next competition came up, which was just three months later at the end of the summer, there was this uh, competition to enter the third cycle or Cycle de Perfectionnement, you know. And um, only the people that had uh, garnered a first prize, were able to actually enter it, and then from that they picked a couple. And I entered this um, third cycle, and uh, that time actually playing Beethoven, and that same person was in the jury again. Actually, she was the only one that was still there. <laughs> and she gave me her vote, and so it was... Um, but still, I never forgot that. <laughs> You know, there is something about playing with other people, but, um, and you're going to say, well, but chamber music is the epitome of this, and of course it is, because of the intimacy and, and all the things that can be exchanged. But somehow the large format of being on stage with 80 musicians, there is something very, um, I don't know, very, very primal and very, 
very strong about the experience. And there's also the beautiful thing of um, sort of um, thinking out loud in a way for me when you play with orchestra. The extra pleasure in chamber music comes from the fact that it's perhaps easier to feel as if the music is being written at the moment you play it because you have less people involved and if somebody tries something out of the ordinary, something that wasn't done in the rehearsal, you have more flexibility to follow when it's three, four, five of you versus 80. Said music saved me. I have no idea where I would be today if, uh, if I hadn't found it. The Wolf Project for me now is more a um, responsibility. It certainly has never been a pastime, but now the more time goes, the more I feel that it's part of having to give back and doing something responsible. In the beginning, it was my fascination for the animal itself for animals in general, and then for the wolf itself and what the wolf represents, that really made me go into this. Here you have Apache, who's actually the alpha male. He's a mix of subspecies. He's a mix of Arctic and British Columbian. He is actually four years old this spring. And he's the dominant male of the two. Over there, lying down, you have Kyla, the only female of the group, and she's the oldest. She's actually uh, six years old. And then somewhere in the distance back there, Lucas, that's the younger male. The whole idea of working with wolves became a mission instead of just a passion. Um, and the idea of teaching people about top predators it's, you know, it's a very charismatic animal, at the same time it's a very controversial animal, and it really, for me, it epitomizes the challenges of our relationship to, uh, to nature and how we place ourselves in the big picture. So, and again, it's, it's something that, you know, in order to leave a better world, a more complete world for future generations, um, and it really has to do with the quality of life of humans, as much as humans don't always see this. It's always fascinating to me to see that when people talk about nature, they talk about humans, and then they talk about the natural world. And of course, they don't see that we're obviously part of it and that everything you do to nature, you do yourself in the end. And, um, and wolves are great teachers that way. And that's really the role of these as you know, ambassadors of their species. And so that was the idea, was to found a nonprofit organization that would concentrate on educating people about wolves, but wildlife in general, um, the wilderness, natural habitat, and our relationship to the environment and our, you know, hopefully soon to be improved ecological wisdom. Yeah. I would say that the first thing that I thought was really worth looking into is the uh, gap between what wolves 
are, their true nature, and what people imagine of them. Um, you know, the wolf is probably the most symbolically charged animal in all cultures. If you go into Lower Westchester or any of the other box stops, you're on the wrong train. This is an express. The next station stop will be Harlem, 125th Street. Oh, in 1995, the National Park Service and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife decided to reintroduce wolves into the park. Uh, the wolves had been gone for a number of decades. Since the 1930s, basically, they had been um, exterminated and they were gone from the park. Obviously, the wolf was the missing link in the ecology of Yellowstone, being the top predator, so they decided to return it. Now, um, one of the things that motivated them from returning wolves was the, um, the disease and the um, unhealthy state of a lot of tree species that was caused by ungulates overgrazing and overpopulating their range. And that's a problem with prey. The prey of the wolf, when not kept in check, will proliferate beyond the carrying capacity of the environs. And really what happened was they had erosion problems as well because of the overbrowsing of the uh, of the elk. And so that, you know, that was obviously taken care of by the return of the wolf. But one thing that was not really uh, foreseen by the scientists there was the return of the birds of prey. And what happened was before the wolf was returned, um, the ruling carnivore there was a the coyote. And um, coyotes prey mainly on smaller animals and mostly on rodents. And of course, that's also the prime food source for birds of prey. And so there was just not enough rodents for the coyotes and the hawks and the eagles um, in Yellowstone. And so within those two years of the wolf being reintroduced, the coyote population diminished by half and that enabled the birds of prey to actually return to the park. There was all of a sudden enough food for them. And that's the perfect example of how the wolf benefits its environment as the top predator. It's really an engineer of biodiversity and the ecology is brought back into balance um, with the top predator present. Let's see, okay. Yeah, it's doing good. No, 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 we need that film. Hello, Shetty. Henry was hired to take pictures of me eight years ago. That's how we met for a photo session. And, uh, and I will always remember this day. You know, somehow it doesn't matter how far back, but you can have a very vivid moment in your memory and you remember everything about it. You remember the decoration of the room, the smells in the room. And this is one of these, uh, one of these instances. And somehow when I saw him the first time, from that first day on, I knew, I just knew what our life together was going to be. Unrealistic as it seemed at the time. And it took a year for things to happen, but you know, here we are. So it was a really beautiful experience. And, uh, and I've actually learned a lot about you know, me, about what relationships really are, because you, you can never take it for granted and it's work. But as long as what you get from working on it is worthwhile, then then you stay in it. For me, the Schumann Piano Concerto, um, it's a piece of ambiguity. You know, I have a very strange relationship to it. It's very mysterious, it's elusive. It's never really, really there. The first movement is like a, a mini symphonic poem with a piano beautifully integrated in the orchestra. It's the most chamber music-like concerto of all the romantic concertos out there.
So here we are at Symphony Space because in a few minutes we start this radio show for WNYC, which is um, public radio here. Well, I've, I've read that you often practice without a piano. You just practice in your head. How does that work? Yes, that's... Um, it's difficult to explain it, but it's... Well, if you know the piece, if you're familiar with the piece, you just play it through your head and you go through conceptual changes. Um, you move your fingers ones. while you're doing it? No. No, it's more a matter of... Um, Oh, that would be pretty silly, wouldn't it? Um, well, you never know what people need to people reassure themselves. People play them, air so. guitar. <laughs> Anything, any activity. But no, you don't know what people need to, uh, to reassure themselves um, about the relationship they have with the instrument. And some people need constant reinforcement. But I think most of it happens in the head. Um, and as long as you have a clear mental image of what you want to do, there is not as much need for reinforcement as, as people think. When I was, I think, 11, I was working on a um, prelude and fugue of Bach in F-sharp major. And I started seeing a red, um, just a red shape moving around uh, of, of um, undefined contours. And, um, you know, but I assumed that everybody saw that. And then one day when I was asked fairly recently, as a matter of fact, you know, has it ever happened to you? Because this phen phenomenon is being studied a little more now. And I said, well, of course, but I thought everybody felt it. I think more people, and you know, it's always the same, the same story. It's if you start tuning into those things, then all of a sudden you realize that you were experiencing them. You just were too distracted to even realize beforehand. And it's not always notes. Sometimes it's whole pieces that have certain sometimes, colors. Sometimes, yes. Sometimes whole pieces have a uh, uh, just a, a color that corresponds to the overall tonality. And other times it's note by note. Well, one of the things that makes you different from some musicians is you've often said you love to take risks. Now, some people, I think, probably just assume you mean that in connection to your wolves, but you take musical risks too, don't you? No, I, and that's really what I meant when I was talking about this. You know, it depends how you view music performance, and I think that if you, um, if you um, strive for safety, if you get out there trying to just, you know, maybe replicate the dress rehearsal or, or your own practice session, you know, it's fine and can be very satisfying and you can put out a performance that's you know technically impeccable and musically convincing and 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 very fine and that's that's okay but you know life is too short and for me music performance should really have something in it that's going to either transport people or irritate them um you know anything rather than just simple contentment elaine is interesting as a musician precisely because she has these other interests as a person and of, about which she's equally as passionate she cares as much about the wolves and about what we're doing with the wolf center as she does about the music and i think that makes her music more interesting sometimes people in the music world think that it's a distraction but i think and she thinks that you can't be, you can't give 100% every time, all the time. You can give 100% here and 100% on something different, but the person I think who goes out and plays every night has to, in some way, do a machine performance, as opposed to Elaine, who will play the same piece three different nights and you'll have had three entirely different experiences. And again, a lot of that, I think, is due to her obsession or passion with these other interests. I have no, no problem with the, uh, the change of location. What bothers me the most is the, um, just the traveling part, the airlines, the constant delays, overbookings, luggage that does not arrive. That's really the problem for me. Um, because the more you travel, of course, statistically, the more problems you encounter, and that's sometimes a little aggravating. But otherwise, you know, it's, for me, it has never been difficult uh, to just stay focused on what I have to do, regardless of what location I'm in. My debut at the Proms is very exciting. You know, I've never been here, but the hall is absolutely superb. Already when you walk into the empty hall, it's, you can feel there's already something special there. But of course, what I expect even more from is the audience. You know, I've been told, a friend told me recently that everybody always plays well at the Proms because of the public and how attentive they are and how supportive and how they sort of carry the performers.
the Beethoven Fourth Concerto for me is is just one of the most beautiful things ever written for piano and orchestra, and I really believe to this day still one of the most original ones. I mean, if you think about how the concerto starts, which for the time was you know a revolution with the piano beginning the piece, and and then of course the format of the second movement in this dialogue. I mean, it really remains one of the most incredible things ever written. So, and it has a special place in my heart uh, amongst the five concerti. It, it's for me the the most. Um, that's going to sound bizarre, the most different. I mean, they're all different, of course, but this one really stands, I think, aside in the quality of expression and this um, sort of uh, philosophical quality to the concerto. For me, it's a concerto that takes place already beyond the you know, basic human emotions, unlike the other four. Tomorrow I'm going back to Berlin, and then I will be back home for a week, um, and then on to Vancouver and the west coast of the United States. So. My relationship to the piano as an instrument, and not this piano, but pianos in particular, is a very peculiar one. I stayed for years without a piano, a real piano, should I say. I had an upright for years um, and never really felt I would ever need anything different. And, um, and then only two years ago, I started to think, you know, it would be actually nice for me to enjoy myself. And I always thought that if I could really um, produce a sound that I was satisfied with on an upright, then I could bring out all the colors and, and you know, sounds that, um, that a better piano would allow me to. And it would all feel, you know, like nothing was happening, like I didn't have to work at it. And then I came to Berlin for this first recording session here in the Teldex Studios. And there were two instruments that um, Serge had selected for me, and I liked neither. Um, just did not feel physically in tune with them. And um, so he was somewhat surprised, because that had not happened before, of all the pianos that he had ever had ready for me. We went to the uh, Steinway house, and uh, he said, well, there's another one there, you can try it, but it's new. And of course, I thought new, that probably means green. You know, sometimes pianos coming out of the factory are a bit stiff and ungenerous. And so I thought, well, you know, I don't know. So we went there and I played it and immediately, I just had this flash of, I must have this piano. And I thought, well, okay, well, you know, see you about that tomorrow morning and see how you feel if you're still thinking about it. And sure enough, the next morning, I thought I, and it was something that I never, I never thought I would ever want a D. I don't even really have the room for a D um, in my house. This is so I almost the one. left hand, yeah. I think this is something in the left hand after the true. Yeah. Records definitely give me a kick. The idea of them, prior to them I get excited. During, it's a process that sometimes it is hard to recover from because you just, you're, I can be endlessly nostalgic for days after a record. And then afterwards, it just, it stays with you. And it stays with you in a very vivid way. You know, you can remember within a one hour, you know, uh, segment of the recording session, all of the different frames of mind that you went through. And, uh, and it's, it's a very special um, sort of memory. It's almost as powerful as what smells can bring back to you, except there, there is no smell to trigger it. And I would do the second time. From 26, yeah. Yeah, but the trills are very good here. Aha, okay, no my God, so look
I mean, it's almost like a fetish. They will come afterwards and all of a sudden, you know, the object has to be signed. Sometimes I wonder about the lasting effect of recording, because there are so few of my own records that I actually like. Very nice concert. The best for me about perhaps. But to see that sometimes just a detail can be enough for a person who heard it. It makes it all worthwhile. Then, uh, Just want to say hi. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? Nice to see you, Florence. Ça va? Là. C'était bien. So, I'm here in the lobby of the Concert House in Oslo, and um, this is the last leg of a tour that started on uh, January 8th in Toulouse, actually. Um, and then I went on to Leipzig and other places in Germany. And actually, being here in Europe for two and a half weeks, three weeks is usually my limit. I usually do not like to stay any longer than that, except for the occasional, you know, twice a year tours that are that have to be longer than this. But otherwise, I like to keep it um, so that I can get home fairly quickly because I do not like to live out of a suitcase for too long. As a conductor, uh, you will find sometimes you do pieces where the soloist is really guiding most of the way. But there's also uh, places where I take over. Through the rehearsals, uh, through speaking and playing together, we gradually come to what we think is our our way with it uh, at this at this moment.
must say that certainly in this case, I think he's actually Thomas Dalskart is absolutely great. He's very open. He has a very um, you do this slower? Classical and intense at the same time approach uh, with great respect for the text, um, great respect for different ideas, because there are definitely things I do in this piece which are um, against what you might expect. Um, also, there is a certain pulse to it, which is, I wouldn't say necessarily unusual, but unusual to someone who's conducted it a lot with a lot of different people. And so I really, um, I was very touched by this sort of openness of mind that he had. Yes. But I think once we take them down, you you might have a chance. Do you have any further questions in the uh, first movie? I have one thing. Yeah, this was when we did it. That was that was fine. Um, I I think it's too slow if we are exactly the same when when you're so slow here because yes. we have become it so, so slow. So I prefer not to be stay. So I move it a little bit there. Good. And then Good. you take a little bit of time over that from what I yes, what you I did last time. I like playing with the Helene Grimo very much. I think what I like the most mm. is Fine. the um, striving for the ideal and still being able to be very spontaneous. So we are able to create in the moment, but there are ground rules, there are things we we know we agree on on the way. So um, by that I think uh, we're able to create an exciting performance and she certainly is through her um, very characterful uh, playing. I like it very much. here yesterday there was one piano on stage for the rehearsal and um, I didn't get a chance to try it beforehand I just started playing the concerto and I felt immediately that this wasn't a piano that I was going to be happy with it, somehow it just wasn't responsive enough it seemed very dull I mean it had this problem which you can sometimes find it's not uh, really a surprise it tends to be um, just more dull in the middle register and um, so I knew I was going to ask for a second choice, and sure enough, they said, well, there is a choice. There is this older piano there, which is usually used in the orchestra as the orchestra instrument. Um, so they were very kind to uh, let me play the other one this morning. You know, it's another one of those simple chemistries and you can get to a town and they'll tell you that somebody else really disliked the piano and intensely complained and then you're surprised because you find there's no problem with it whatsoever and then other times it's just the opposite. In this case it's not a clear-cut situation because I can see that there were some excerpts of the piece that I would actually be happier with on the newer piano, yesterday's instrument. Um, so, you know, in this case, it's very much a compromise.
walking into a different hall every time is, um, it's the great unknown. It's the, you know, abim. It's um, the great vacuum somehow. But it's the only thing that gives the hall its justification for me is the sense of the public that's sitting in it. And sometimes I would love to have this um, ubiquity gift so I could be on stage and be out there at the same time and, 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 and see what really happens and hear what happens because that can be so, um, so misleading. For me, Brahms' first concerto is, uh, it's a piece, it's a vital piece, it's a piece I need to survive, and there aren't very many of those, perhaps two or three. It was written fairly early in Brahms' life, and it's really a, for me, it's a testament, it's a requiem. Um, it has a, a density and a, and a gravity of expression that I, I find very moving, and one of the things I love the most about it is this, this raw power. I always think of Schumann, because when Brahms wrote it, it was after Schumann's first suicide attempt. You know, when I hear the orchestra introduction, which is, of course, fairly long, um, it's a piece where I see, I see my life unrolling, you know, as, as the music goes. It's a very, it's a very, very personal experience for me. The quality of piano playing today is very high. If you think about, um, technical accomplishments. Um, you know, it's true that repertoire that was thought of as unplayable or extremely difficult or only playable by a few is now just standard, you know, conservatory repertoire that students can play very easily um, before they even finish the curriculum. But for me, the most important is for the artist to have a voice, to have something original to say, something personal, um, and to have an impact when they do it, an emotional impact. Piano technique for me is much more than just the mechanical aspect of it. It's you know how you use the pedal, it's the sound, it's how you phrase, it's um, how you build a piece, how you give a piece its, its architecture and then let it have its own life at the time of the concert. So for me it's a much broader term than um, you know what people usually think of when they think about technique, meaning you know prowess, um, just you know, pyrotechnics.